Geneva is about to get a taste of the blues from a number one selling blues guitarist. She is Joanne Shaw Taylor. She's set to play music from her new album, Nobody's Fool, and more at the Smith Opera House in Geneva this weekend. Joanne is here joining us via Zoom this morning. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy tour schedule to speak with us. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're more than welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me ask to start things out. Will this be your first time coming to uh, this part of New York State? Um, my geography fails me uh, because I've been to, to so many places at this point. But we've done a lot around sort of Buffalo, Syracuse. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I've, I've never been to Geneva. I know that. I've been to the other Geneva, but not this one. Um, so, yeah, this is the first time there. Well, I, listen, you're going to love it, um, and I'm sure you are going to uh, do very well here, and people are very excited to to hear you and see you and watch you perform. I want to uh, talk about the, the new album, uh, the latest album, Nobody's Fool, um, held a landmark release. Uh, can you talk to us about the collaborative process of putting something like that together? Yeah, this was actually a really interesting album for me because I've, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm well known as a blues guitarist, but I did, after COVID, I did two sort of quite traditional blues albums back to back. I did a, an album of blues covers and then we did a live version. So it's kind of fun for me to kind of feel like this is probably the one time I can kind of deviate from the blues and just kind of push my songwriting and, and see what I can come up with and kind of sneak it out in a way. Um so it was a really fun album to write. Um, I was going through a breakup at the time, so there was obviously a lot of ammunition there for uh, for documenting emotions. Um, so yeah, it was just it was really lovely to kind of hide away and push myself to write outside of my usual box. And then, of course, you know you've got two producers who I've worked with previously who are both dear friends. So there's a, a great level of trust there, Joe Bonamassa and Josh Smith. So it's, um, I mean, it's always beautiful to hear your songs, you know, as I demo them out and then you take them in a studio and hear the band you sort of bring them to life. But it was, uh, you know, the, the guys had some really interesting ideas with this. So it was, um, it's kind of a new, newish album for me and just a really fun experience. I, I'm sorry to hear about the breakup and I hate to go back to it, but you brought it up and I think it's part of uh, the evolution of your music. Uh, how does how does that that paint itself for you? How do you uh, create from from such deep emotion? You know, I think all music really, you know, I mean, that's the thing about blues music is it was originally a way of processing your emotions and there's no really stronger emotions than love and loss and whether that be a relationship or a friendship or you know grieving a parent or which you know i write a song about that and hear about my mom who passed away in 2013 um so it's just a great way of processing you know your emotions that really is what art is isn't it it's um taking your emotions and, and being able to create something positive out of them so you know it's always very i'm very lucky you know it's nice most people go through these things but they don't get to sit down and write an album from it that hopefully other people get you know joy and, and benefit out of and as soon as i'm done with the songs that chapter's done and those emotions have been you know kind of healed i suppose when you are asked to perform some of those songs again, uh, building up a catalog, going on tour, what is it like to tap back? Do you have to tap back into that that headspace, that heart space that you were in when you wrote it to give the song your all? Or has that has that wound healed enough that you know how to kind of dance around it and make it work for your benefit yeah i think for me you know and i can only speak for me and not other artists or writers for me when i get on stage it's about making the audience feel that you know that's how i connect to them hopefully i've written lyrics that they can um relate to um and maybe they're going through something like that so it's you know it's there like you understood you know how you felt in that moment but no i don't go on stage and you know it's like this experience where i come off and i'm just crying in a ball for two hours having to like you know uh push myself through through old memories it's uh you know it, it's a nice experience performing 
815. And there is much more coming up with Joanne at 830. I loved chatting with her because of how she handled a technical issue we were having. We are going to show that to you coming up. But first, it's the weekend buzz right after the break. All right, now we're going to get back to our interview with blues guitarist Joanne Shaw Taylor. You can see her tomorrow night at the Smith Opera House in Geneva. She's not only a great musician, but she's also a great sport. A behind the scenes kind of story. We had a technical problem yesterday on Zoom, and I could not hear her for a solid 20 minutes. So I asked her questions, and she held up notes as answers. Take a look started at a very young age. I mean, you were playing for a long time, really discovered and kind of started to take off in your, your teens, what, 16, I believe. Um, looking back, now you're, I'm not going to guess an age, but 30s-ish, looking back, would you ever have 38, the exact same as me? Um, would you have ever imagined this would be your life at this point? I imagined, but it's been a wonderful surprise. I bet it has. I bet it has. A beautiful life. Oh, that's incredible. I like that. That was a lot of fun with her. Uh, with that, we're going to go back to the interview. We could actually hear one another uh, with what Joanne Shaw Taylor puts into her performances. Here you are. We're looking at some images of you up there on stage performing, and I mean, it's electric. You can you can really see them. There's there's a magic there. There's an electricity there. There's a connection there between you and the audience. And I have to imagine for audience members coming to see you perform, it feels like an individual connection that you have with each and every concert goer. What is it like for you? I mean, I hope it's like that. I mean, for me, it is, I have to say, COVID did me a great deal of good, um, which sounds odd. Bear with me. Um, mm. In terms of, you know, having two years off the road, and I was pretty burned out. And I took a lot, obviously, took a lot of time off touring. And in that time, realized just how fortunate I am to do this, you know, that I get to sing songs about losing my mom or a heartbreak or, you know, the end of a friendship or, or whatever it may be. And the audience doesn't get to do that. You know, they get, they have also lost parents and family members and gone through the same things as me, but they don't have the benefit of, again, being able to write songs. So it is such a beautiful thing to know that you can connect with someone on shared experiences. And, you know, I mean, my job is for the two hours there in front of me to make them feel something and make them leave that concert feeling connected to me and connected to my songs. And hopefully I've gifted them songs that they can keep listening to that um, maybe they understand the message a bit more now that I've been able to kind of personally convey it to them, I suppose. I, I have a feeling that uh, many of your concert goers do feel that way. They, they feel that magic. Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier, well, you wrote down earlier when we, we couldn't hear you. Um, we'll cut to that clip now. It's lovely to make that connection, and I love knowing young girls are, can you just hold that up a little higher? That are watching. Yes. It was about uh, young, young women and young girls watching you perform. And uh, I was asking you about working in such a male-dominated industry or maybe formerly um, male-dominated industry and being a real, uh, you're, you're, uh, you smash the glass ceiling. You're a, you're a barrier breaker. You're somebody out there who's taking risks and you're not asking questions or asking forgiveness. You're just going for it. Where does that strength for, for some of our younger viewers who may be watching, where does that strength from within you come from and have you always had it i think so i think that's how i was raised you know it never occurred to me my parents never mentioned you know i was always a bit of a tomboy into football soccer sorry um <laughs> playing guitar and i had an older brother and you know it was never mentioned to me that i you know girls didn't do those things there was never kind of any discrimination in our house um so it was always a surprise to me when I started gigging and people started referring to me as a, a female guitar player, as if there was a, a difference, you know, mm. it's a gender neutral instrument. 
Um, but that said, because I got so heavily into blues guitar, all my influences were male. Um, and I could try and sound like them because the guitar is a gender neutral instrument, but I couldn't sing like them. So that was quite an interesting... There wasn't one person I could look to and go, that's how I want to sound. You know, there was Bonnie Raid, but I don't play sly guitar. Um, whereas if you're a male guitarist, you've got Eric Clapton and Steve Ray Vaughan and Carlos Santana. There's a you know a million men for you to look up to. So I do hope, if, if nothing else, that at the end of this, there's been one girl that wanted to play guitar or electric blues guitar and was able to look at me and go, oh, well, she did it, so I can do it, you know? I think there's going to be more than more than just one who looks at you and says, oh, if she can do it, I can do it, and gives it their all and goes out and does something. Even if it's not within that industry, if they, if they go out and do something and champion something on their own, I think that... that uh, that means a lot to a lot of people, and I have to imagine you. Um, all right, let's get down to it. You're coming to Geneva. You're showing up this weekend. What can audience members expect? Um, obnoxiously loud blues guitar, um, lots of fun, lots of smiles, and hopefully just a shared connection through songs and stories, I suppose, is the, and a weird British accent in between it all. Does that, does that ever shock people? Sometimes, sometimes people, um, I remember talking to a guitarist online who I'm a big fan of and he's a big fan of mine and we finally met him in person and he was looking at me really strangely and I said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I didn't know you were British, huh. um, which I can imagine was a bit of a surprise when I started jabbering on. Well, listen, I, I think it uh, just makes you all that much more likable because I'm very fond of that accent. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to speak with us. I apologize about the delays in the beginning, but I, uh, again, we're going to make the absolute most of it, um, and I really appreciate your time this morning. You are more than welcome. It's been good fun. Make sure I, I see that video. It gets sent to me of this so I can see what you end up hundred <laughs> percent. Absolutely. Thank you again, and break some legs out there. Thank you, love. Thanks for the time. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.